Well, my heavenly home is bright and fair. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, no pain nor death can enter there. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling, traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling. Oh, my heavenly home is bright and fair. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, it's glittering towers, the sun outshine. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, that heavenly mansion shall be mine. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh yes, I feel like traveling, traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, for my heavenly home is bright and fair. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Well, let others seek a home below. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Power and waves or flow, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling, traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. For my heavenly home is bright and fair, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, the Lord has been so good to me. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, until that blessed home I see. Yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling, traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. traveling on oh yes and when the battle's over we shall wear a crown we shall wear a crown we shall wear a crown oh when the battle's over we shall wear a crown in that new Jerusalem oh wear a crown oh wear a crown oh wear a bright and shiny Must I be carried to the skies on a flowery bed of ease? While others fought to win the prize and sail the blood. Oh, let's sing that fourth verse. Oh, sure, I must fight if I would reign, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Oh yes, when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. Oh, we shall wear a crown. We shall 
wear a crown. Oh, when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in that new Jerusalem. Oh, wear a crown. Oh, wear a crown. Oh, wear a bright and shining crown. Oh, when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Well, fill my way every day with love. Oh, as I walk with that heavenly dove. Oh, let me go all the while with a song and a smile. Fill my way every day with love. Well, let me walk, blessed Lord, in the way Thou hast gone, leading straight to the land above. Oh, I'm giving cheer everywhere to the sad and the lone. Oh, fill my way every day with love. Well, fill my way every day with love As I walk with that heavenly dove Oh, let me go all the while with a song and a smile Fill my way every day Oh, let's sing that again Well, fill my way every day with love Oh, as I walk with the heavenly dove Oh, let me go all the while with a song and a smile. Fill my way every day with love. Oh, give the Lord a hand offering of praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Fill my way with love. I want his love, saints. I want it all over me this morning. Amen. Oh, I surrender it all. I surrender it all. Whatever it is in my life that is a big hindrance, Lord, I surrender. Just 
have preeminence within this flesh. Lord, take control. I surrender all. Amen. That's what I want, saints, just a further surrender. Amen. Come into the holy of holies. Enter by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, come into His presence with singing. Oh, worship at the throne of God. Oh, just. Worship at the throne of God. 
let's just sing the second verse. Just listen to the words. Oh, Lord, my heart's desire is to burn with spirit fire. Oh, my purpose is to worship you that we're standing here by your grace by the purity of your thoughts before the foundation of the world God we know Lord that your grace and your mercy that's in our lives that has brought us to this place again God as you continually unveil yourself to show us your great plan God how amazing it is to find ourselves included in that plan Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for the privilege, Lord, of standing here, hearing the things that we hear and seeing the things we see. God, I pray that we would give you the reverence that you deserve, that we would, Lord, consider you holy and your word sacred in these times precious. May, Lord, we come, Lord, to sit at your feet now this morning to receive from you the bread of life you would give us, grant us, Lord, yet another portion of yourself, that we might be molded more into your image and come more into your likeness day by day. Pray that you would take preeminence in this service, Lord, that you would take this vessel under your control, Lord, that I may yield myself to you and that you could come and do what you intend to do this morning. God, I pray you give us ears to hear, heart to perceive, Lord, all that you have. May you grant us your spirit of revelation upon your word. We love you. May you be the glorified one in our midst. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. May God bless you. You can be seated for just a moment. Thank you, musicians. Amen, I just want to give you a little update. I uh, had a chance to uh, text with Brother Emmanuel Sabasu, and he made it safely to the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's beginning his work, 
He had a Sunday morning service, so they're ahead of us, so I think he's already preached today. He's got a service Tuesday and then Wednesday. Then he's flying over to the Northeast province to do some work over there for a few days. So just remember him in prayer and remember his family that is here, and uh, we don't want to forget him. Also, I want to thank you all for your prayers for our family these last few days. The, the funeral uh, went, went well. It went really well. And we appreciate those of you who made it down for the visitation and for the funeral. May God bless you for that. It really meant a lot to us, and it meant a lot to my mom. And uh, she's been appreciating all the text and all the cards and all the sympathy that you've expressed. And it's been a real blessing and a real encouragement to her. So God bless you all, and thank you for that. Amen. If you ever want to know how important a body is, just wait till a trial or difficulty hits your family and you realize how much you love God's family, amen, how much they mean to you. I also want to let you know that uh, this coming Sunday, a week from today, I'll be going down to preach in Junction City to the ex-Amish group of believers down there. They called and asked me uh, some time ago, and we've been working on it, so that date works out well, so I'll be going there. But also, I got a call from Brother Simon Abbott from UK. He called me a few weeks ago and told me that he's coming. So that him and his wife and his wife's mother, Sister Pawnee, will be here. Uh, actually, late Wednesday night, they arrive in Cleveland and drive down. So they'll be here, I think, for about two weeks. And so when I found out he was going to be here the same time I was going to be gone, I called and asked him if he would take the service, and he said he would. So I said, well, thank God he provided, Amen. So it was just good timing. So also pray for their traveling. They'll be, they'll be leaving, uh, I think, Wednesday early morning. So pray for them. And then pray, if you don't mind, pray for us. Remember us for that service next Sunday. I'll remind you again on Wednesday and then also for the service here. Amen. Thank God. Let's all stand. If we could, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Verse 18, Paul's just instructing the saints to pray. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. So he's saying, pray for me also that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. May God bless us as we look at his word. Amen. I don't know, Brother Brendan made this statement, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to quote it exactly right, but he made the statement something like preaching is never something you get used to. And I, I'm exactly the same way. I'm standing here and, and uh, in turmoil because everything gets all mixed up and jumbled up. And you have one thing in your mind and you're pretty sure you're going to do something. And then late in the evening, the night before, God changes everything. And so we're going in a different direction than I thought we were going to go in. So that doesn't bother you any, but it bothers me a whole lot. Amen. So I probably shouldn't even tell you because it doesn't make any difference. But, but for me, uh, I get all jumbled up. So I'm standing here by faith. Amen. Saying, God, I just trust your leadership. And we're asking God to take control and speak his word that he would minister through a gift. Amen. Brother Ram said a gift is just to get yourself out of the way. And so that's what I'm struggling to do right now is pull it into another gear and get myself relaxed so that God can take over. But when we get to this subject, this is something that I was reading in my, just my daily devotions, just my Bible reading, and it struck me and I got excited about it. I never intended to preach on it. I just got excited about it. And then yesterday afternoon, it started working on me. And by evening, I, I knew I had to go this direction. But when Paul is asking for prayer, he's asking prayer that utterance may be given unto me that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And that phrase struck my heart. He wasn't asking that he would have boldness to preach the gospel, but the mystery of the gospel. Because there's, there's a gospel, but there's a mystery of the gospel as well. Amen. And that's what Paul was wanting to get over was the mystery of the gospel that had been given to him. 
And, uh, and he was preaching it in a mystery. And it's amazing how many times Paul talks about preaching the mystery, the hidden things, the mystery that had not been known. And now he wants to boldly preach the mystery of the gospel that he is an ambassador for. When we look up this word mystery in the Greek, this is the definition that it gives. A hidden thing, a secret, generally mysteries, religious secrets, uh, confided only to the initiated and not to ordinary mortals. Something about that definition just did, got, got my juices going. Amen. Uh, the religious secrets confided only to the initiated and not to ordinary mortals. Hey, I don't want to be an ordinary mortal. Amen. I want to be one of the initiated. He also says here, there's several different definitions. I'll read this next one. A hidden or, or secret thing, not obvious to the understanding. That's why, listen, we can't intellectually go to the Bible, amen, and be able to draw these things out, amen, because it doesn't come that way. These things are written in mysteries. It takes the spirit of revelation, amen, to pull out what is not obvious to the understanding. I mean, we have, because, of, because of, of education and because of a translation of the Bible, amen, there's an intelligence that can give us understanding of words that we read, but that won't give you the understanding of the mystery. It'll only give you the understanding of the text. And understanding the text doesn't equal to understanding the mystery. Amen, we'll get into that in a minute. The next definition, he says, a hidden purpose or counsel, secret will of men of God, the secret counsels which govern God in dealing with the righteous, which are hidden from ungodly and wicked men, but plain to the godly. Amen. I love these definitions. I mean, we're just going to preach out of the concordance. Amen. Amen. Because these things are not obvious to the understanding and it's ways in which God is dealing with his children or his elect, amen? And it's not known or revealed to the wicked or ungodly, but it's made plain to the godly, amen? It's something that's not obvious to understanding, but it's plain, made plain by revelation to the godly. And that's why for you, it's so easy to see the message. You just see it. You can't help from see it. Brother Branham said, once you see this message, you can't see anything else. Amen. To you, it's been plainly revealed revealed, amen, because it was for you, amen, but it wasn't obvious to understanding. That's why when you go to explain it to somebody, a coworker, a family member, they said, I just can't get it. I just don't know what you're saying. It doesn't make sense to me. And then all of a sudden you realize the gospel, amen, you're, you're speaking now the mystery of the gospel. Yes, right. Not what's on the surface, but what's hidden amen. in the text. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So now Paul's saying, I have a revelation of the mystery of Christ. And this is, I, I, you've heard the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you, and how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So God revealed it to him. Amen, it's a mystery. It wasn't something obvious to the understanding. And the question is, where is Paul going to go to get this mystery? Amen, he's got to go to Christ. God's got to reveal to him the mystery. Amen, and then once he gets the mystery, then he's going to go back to his Bible. And when he goes back to his Bible with the revelation of the mystery, he's going to pull it out of the Old Testament. Amen. But he wasn't able to pull it out of the Old Testament before. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He, he was in the best teaching, the best school that he could be in. And he wasn't able to pull this mystery himself until he met Christ. He met the pillar of fire and he went and learned the mystery of Christ. And then he went back to the Bible, and when he went back to the Bible, after his eyes had been opened, amen, then he could see the mystery all through the scriptures. Praise God. Now let's read this again. Verse 5, 
which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Praise God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, verse six. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory." He said, they didn't know it. If they had known it, they would have ne- if they had known the truth of who Jesus Christ was, they would have never crucified him. But they didn't know. But he says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now, he wanted to, he was praying for the Ephesian church, amen, to pray for him, that utterance would be given to him, that he could speak boldly the mystery of the gospel, amen. And you can boldly speak the mystery of the gospel, but you're still preaching in a mystery. You're still speaking in a mystery, amen, because it's only for those who have the receptor on the inside that can pick up the mystery because it's not obvious to the understanding, Amen. That, which, which makes me thank God Almighty that he put something in me before the foundation of the world, a receptor that could receive, amen, the mystery when the mystery is preached boldly. It was preached boldly by the prophet. It's been preached boldly by many men, amen, and it goes over the tops of uh, uh, so many heads, but by the grace of God, he has put something in his elect seed, amen, that it won't just go over the head and it won't just rattle around in the head for debate and discussion and confusion, but it'll strike a crystal, amen. It'll strike a receiver down in the soul that'll say that ain't nothing but the truth amen without the intellect being able to tie all the pieces together something will say that's the truth by the grace of God amen so let's go to Romans 16 Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Amen. If you want to be established, amen, you need you need the gospel, but you need the revelation of the mystery. The revelation, the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So now the apostle Paul the Apostle Paul now is, is on a journey. He's on a journey to Damascus because he's going to, to haul this new sect of these, uh, of these religious blasphemers, those that he thought were polluting and corrupting the word of God. And he goes out uh, 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 zealous for the word of God. And he gets dispatched with letters from the high priest and from the elders to go. And on the way to Damascus, he comes in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he was in the form of a pillar of fire and it smote him down to the ground and he called out amen to him and he identified himself. That pillar of fire was Jesus Christ whom he was persecuting, but he wasn't persecuting, amen, a body, a human body that was Jesus Christ was dwelling, dwelling in. He was persecuting the church that Jesus Christ was dwelling in. Those were the bodies, and, and all of a sudden he got a revelation right there, and then he went out into the Arabian, to the desert to receive the, the mystery of the Bible, amen, and he received it by Christ himself, by revelation, amen, because there was a measure of dispensation of grace given to him, to usward. Amen. Then he come out preaching the mystery of the gospel, amen, and, and even in this day, there's so many people that get the gospel, but what about the mystery of the gospel? Amen. There's so many people that are hitting a surface level of the gospel and they're understanding that Jesus Christ came and died for sinners and, and that he shed his blood on Calvary to redeem back the world and those that are lost. And amen, there's a surface of the gospel, but my, there's a mystery in that, amen. There's a mystery in Calvary and the mystery lay inside Jesus Christ while he was nailed to the cross on Calvary. There was a mystery in there. Amen. The Apostle Paul comes now when he gets the revelation of this mystery. Now he's recognizing, amen, who Christ is, that he's the Messiah, that all the prophets were speaking of him, that everything that was prophesied had now taken place, and he's able to go back with his eyes open. Listen, he, I, 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 I don't understand. I don't know how to say it. Let's just say it this way. I don't know how to say what I want to say, so you just bear with me for a minute. It doesn't work backwards. He doesn't study, 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 and all of a sudden know the mystery, amen? God comes to him and reveals to him the mystery, and then when he goes back to the book, it all unfolds. He can go back, amen, all those years with Gamaliel, all those studying of the Bibles and reading of the scrolls and the time spent in the, in the temple. He said he had to count it as dung that he might know and win Christ. But it doesn't mean now he quit reading his Bible and he gave up on the scrolls. No, when he's still in prison, amen, he's asking, I think it is Timothy, to come and bring him the parchments and especially the scrolls. He wants his Bible. Why? Because his eyes are open and now he can see the mystery that he had missed all of his life. And that in ages before, they were godly men. They were men of God. They were the right kind of man in the right season. But this mystery was veiled and they couldn't see it either. And neither could the apostle Paul see it until God lifted the veil off of his eyes. Amen. And then he comes and he starts preaching things that absolutely rock the foundation of the Jewish world. Amen. They can't take it. They absolutely can't take what he's saying. He, he, they, they, he says, you know, when he's standing uh, uh, in, in the court, he says, and the way that it's called heresy is the way that I worship. He didn't say he worshiped by heresy, but the way it's called heresy because it was so different, amen, than their understanding of the Bible that they thought he was a heretic. They wanted to kill him and destroy him because they thought he was blaspheming and destroying the, the word of God. And in their effort to protect the truth. They were trying to kill the one whose eyes was open to the truth. See, it's not an abundance of study that brings the revelation. The revelation is the grace of God. The word must be preached. And under the preaching of the word, amen, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a release of the revelation and those with a receptor can catch it. And, and after they catch it, they go back and say, it's right there. How did I miss it? Like you go to the scripture that says, amen, baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when you go back to Matthew uh, 28, 19, he said, in the name of the Father and the, the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then all of a sudden, when the, when the light switch flips, you say, it says name. There's just only one name. Amen. It doesn't say names, plural. It's just name. I mean, you wouldn't believe how many people you try to explain that to and you explain it and they say, yeah, I don't understand. He says, yeah, that's what he said. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But you say, no, he said name, not names, plural name. Yeah, Father, Son, I mean, because there's got to be a receptor on the inside. And all of a sudden, when it goes off, it just goes off. And once you see it, you can't see anything else. It's just there. Amen. That's why for me, I, 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 don't, I, I don't understand some of the ideology that we have sometimes that we have to make things simple. 
I think the gospel's simple. I think the message is simple. And sometimes when there's an adversion to preaching on mysteries, listen, that's all Paul preached. Paul preached the mystery that was hid from the foundation of the world, but now is made known. Paul, Paul's whole ministry, his whole ministry was preaching the mysteries that was veiled in the Old Testament. Amen. So, so there's, not, there's, there's no need, amen, for us to say, you know, don't preach on the mysteries. And don't, the, that, that's the message. The message is the mystery that was laying in the New Testament. Amen. amen. That's what Brother Branham was called to do is come and break that mystery for us. And so that's where I, I sometimes... I get concerned at the direction. Sometimes I see things going in a pool to try to bring things down, to simplify it. And it seems like what we're trying to do sometimes is we're trying to make it obvious to the intellect. But a mystery is something that's not obvious to the intellect, but it's plainly seen by the godly. Amen. And so, so when we have a desire, it's like, uh, how, can I, how can I simplify this so that everybody can catch it? Well, the reality is everybody's not supposed to catch it. It's not for everybody to catch. It's only for the elect. And sometimes we think that if we can simplify it down a little bit or make it a little bit easier or, or less complex, listen, I don't know how to make God less complex. He is everything. He, he fills everything. He is everything. I don't know. I mean, the message is deep. I don't know how to make it shallow. Amen. It's simple, but it's deep. Amen. It's so easy to understand. There's things in it I still don't understand. I don't know how to change that. That's just the word of God. That's the same thing with the Bible I read. It's deep. It's complex. It goes everywhere. It involves every facet of life. And there's layers to scriptures that keep going deeper. You get a surface layer of the scripture. You read it again and it goes deeper. Then you hear Brother Branham saying something and he ties it to something completely different. And it goes deeper yet. I don't know how to change that. That's the way the word of God is. Amen. And so I believe that what I want to do with all my heart is take the revelation God's given me and, and, and preach it as clearly as I know how. But as clearly as I know how, it's still going to be a mystery. And Paul was preaching the mystery of the gospel. And we're still preaching the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Paul now comes along and he starts taking the Bible and doing things with it that rock the religious world. He comes now and he starts to take the scripture and show them that the seed of Abraham includes Gentiles. Do you know how unbelievable that doctrine was? They, these are people, we, you know, we're standing here having the benefit of 2,000 years of church history. We've known that. It's obvious. It's been taught since you were a child. You've heard the scripture over and over. But if you were there in Paul's day, all you've ever known is God selected a man named Abraham, and he had a physical seed through Isaac, and that seed lineage is the chosen of God, and they're the only ones chosen of God. Amen. And if anybody else wants anything to do with God, they've got to come here to these chosen of God, who is the light to the world. And if they come and and they proselyte themselves among them, then they can be accepted also. But this is the only place where the election is. Is that right? That's, that's what the Jews understood. Now the apostle Paul comes and says, they're not all Israel that is Israel, but, but in the promise shall my seed be, and, and, and unto Isaac. And now he's saying, it's not the natural anymore. You think it's natural. You think because you can chase your lineage back and you can find Abraham back there somewhere that you're part of the elect. But he says, no, the election isn't like that. Amen. Now the election is now not identified through a birth record, but the election is identified by faith. Those in the Gentiles who are able to believe the mystery of the gospel, amen, have evidence that they are the seed of Abraham because they have the faith of their father, Abraham. What was the faith of Abraham? Abraham was able to believe what God told him for his day. When God came and gave him a message, he believed it. When others doubted it, he believed it. When things went wrong, he believed it. 
And he became the father of faith to the faithful, amen, that are the seed of Abraham. And that seed, Paul tells us, is not many as in seeds, but singular one, which is Christ. So now the seed of Abraham is Christ, the anointed word. And then the apostle Paul comes and says, now you by faith are seed of Abraham. Now what does that make me? That makes me part of Christ. The Jews couldn't handle this. You know what they kept saying? The Bible says. 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 says. What were they fighting Paul with? The Bible. The Old Testament, the law and the prophets. When they were disputing with Jesus, they kept going back. Moses said... So Paul, they, and, but Paul knew where he stood because he saw the mystery by revelation. And he kept breaking it down, amen, and preaching the mystery of the gospel, in which now, amen, was showing that Messiah had come and was slain, paid the price for the redemption, and now the, the gospel is going to the Gentiles, and he starts, t- he, he starts going to all the prophecies that were in the Old Testament showing this to be true. He starts preaching predestination and election different than they understood predestination and election. They understood it by God's choice in Abraham and then God's choice in Isaac and then they were all included. And Paul begins to strip that away. That was known to be the truth for so long. But here comes a man saying that he got a revelation of the mystery of the Bible and he begins to change everything that they held to be true. He started preaching that Mount Zion was spiritual, not physical. He started saying that New Jerusalem is your mother and it's not the one that's on earth but it's the one from heaven. That now counts. He started preaching circumcision is the circumcision of the heart, not of the outward flesh. Listen, I mean, if, if we would have been good Pharisees in the day that he started saying that, we would have opened the scroll and went to the scripture and showed where God told Moses to tell Israel to take every male that's born on the eighth day and have them circumcised. And that's exactly verbatim what the Bible says. And there's no wiggle room. We understand Hebrew. But Paul now comes along and listen, I'm, I'm telling you, if, 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 if you were a common Jew in the day, not an elect, not a seed gene of God, but just a Jew, there is no way that you could take what this man is saying. There is absolutely no way because what he's saying is so astronomically different than what you've believed all your life about the Bible. But he's claiming to be preaching the Bible and that there was a mystery in that Bible and he's preaching the mystery out of that Bible and you don't want his mystery because you want to stay with the black, black ink on white paper. Because it's what you've known all of your life. But Paul had the mystery of the gospel, amen. It was revealed unto him. And praise God, we have the mystery of the gospel been restored to us in this end time. And the same thing that Paul did is the same thing that happened in Brother Branham. It was an absolute repeat of the ministry of Apostle Paul. Let's go to Revelation 10 together. Everything that they had physical, Paul turned it spiritual. They had a physical Israel. He made it a spiritual Israel. They had a physical seed. He made it a spiritual seed. They had a physical circumcision. He made it a spiritual circumcision. They had a physical Jerusalem. He made it a spiritual Jerusalem. Can you see how hard it was to believe Paul's message in his day? It wasn't obvious to the intellect. It was only obvious to the seed of God. Even even 
Peter, when Peter is trying to understand what Jesus is saying, he's not comprehending what Jesus is saying, and Jesus intentionally is not making it plain. Is that right? He's intentionally not making it plain. He's not making it easily understood. Jesus is saying things that are so absolutely contrary to common understanding and to their intellect. When he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, I mean, they, there's no way they could comprehend what he was actually talking about. And he was speaking spiritually. They were understanding naturally. And even his disciples didn't understand. But there was something different down in Peter that says, hey, I don't know. He says, will you go also? He says, to whom will we go? I, I don't know. And Brother Ben said, he said, I don't know what you're talking about, but to where else will we go? But we believe and are sure that, that thou art Christ, the son of the living God, and thou, has, thou alone has the words of eternal life. He got that. Where did he get that understanding? That came from inside of him. That was a revelation given to him by God because he was a predestinated seed gene of God. And he was able to catch something, although his intellect couldn't catch and decipher what Jesus was saying. Something inside of him said, I have no place else to go. This is the truth. And if you ask him to explain what was true about it, he couldn't even tell you what was true about the statement because he didn't know what was true about it. All he knew was this is the Son of God, and he alone has the words of eternal life. He got that by revelation. That came not by flesh and blood, but direct revelation from the Father. So Paul was there absolutely tearing apart what they thought was the gospel for them. And he was doing things that, that technically weren't right, but spiritually were correct. Oh, praise God. That's why if, if Jesus could preach the mysteries and not reveal it, because he knew there would come a time that it would be revealed. Paul preached the mystery of the gospel and he wanted to make it plain, but yet he says, but we preach, the, we, we preach the gospel in mysteries. We preach the truth in mysteries. Because the man's mind is darkened. Only those that can receive spiritual revelation are going to understand Paul's ministry. And so when, when, there's a, when there's a temptation or a pressure to water down the message and just stick with maybe the simpler things and not go into the mysteries and not go into the deep things, amen, my, my, my concern is, why can't we just preach the way Brother Branham preached? Why can't we use the terminology he used? They, they say, why do you use this terminology? Why do you use these words? They're hard to understand. Well, God delivered it to us that way. That's the way God brought the message. And God knew that the elect could understand that language. And he used, he used a man with a seventh grade education who didn't always get his words right. Amen. And, and he said, Brother Branham said one time, he says, I hope you get what I'm trying to say. He goes, I don't have education enough to explain it, but I know what I'm talking about. He knows what he's talking about, but doesn't have education enough to explain it. Why would God do something like that? Because God's not trying to get it over to make it obvious to the intellect. He's trying to get it to his children. Remember in Romans, he made it, amen, it made it by faith there, that it could be by grace to the, to the promise so that the promise would be sure to the elect. Amen. So the temptation, amen, just to make it simple, and don't talk about mysteries and don't talk about all these things. My goodness, if that's the way God delivered the message, who am I to doctor it up and fancify it and make it pretty? Why can't I just say what the prophet said and why is that not good enough? Amen, I, I tell you, it will be good enough. It is good enough because the message is here. Amen, it is the mystery of the gospel. And it's here to awaken a, a group of people. Right. And to them, it's plain. Doesn't mean they can explain it. Doesn't mean they can chart it any more than Peter could. All it means is to them, it's plain. What's plain? This is the truth. That's plain. What else is plain than that? I don't know, but I know this is plain. That's the truth. There's so many things there's so many things Brother Bram said, I, I still don't understand. Yes. I don't know why he worded it that way. I don't know why he phrased it that way. I don't know why he said it, but, but it doesn't matter. He's still the truth. The message is true. He's still the vessel that God sent. And I, and I believe that he preached to us the mystery of the gospel. 
Let's go to Revelation chapter 10. Now, before we read Revelation chapter 10, let's read Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. This is the opening of the seventh seal. It's a mystery because there's no symbols given. All we have is silence. All we know is it was opened, but we don't know what happened. It wasn't made plain to us. We go over to Revelation 10, 1 to 7, and Brother Branham attaches Revelation 8, 1 and Revelation 10, 1 to 7 and makes them the same thing, the opening of the seventh seal. In verse 1, he says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets." Amen. The apostle Paul preached to us the mystery of the gospel. Brother Branham was going to bring to us by the grace of God, the mystery of God in the end time. We see here that, that seven thunders uttered their voices. I know you know this, but I just want, I, I feel to review it. Amen. Seven thunders had uttered their voices and John was about to write because whatever they uttered was, was intelligible. He could understand what they said. He heard the voice and he was able to write down what was said in that voice. So he understood. So the, the thunders was some sort of speech words that he could write down. And when he was about to write them down, uh, a voice told him, write not, but seal it up. Amen. And Brother Bram talks about this. We're going to get to this in several places. He talks about it was sealed up, but it was sealed up. Like Daniel was told that the revelation was sealed up to the time of the end. It's going to be sealed up to the time of the end, but God doesn't want it to always remain sealed up to his elect, but there's coming a time that he's going to unseal this portion of scripture to his elect children. Praise God. And in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So we find that these, this is what the prophet says. I'm just going to read a few quotes. This is the message. Is this the sign of the end, sir? This is the message he preached, amen, after he had <clears throat> the experience of spiritually getting caught up in a constellation in his bedroom there, amen, and seeing the, the, little, the little doves come, or the little birds, and then the little doves, and then the constellation of angels, and it nearly packed him out of the room, and, and then people were, came, were coming to him for, for the last couple of months, bringing dreams to him. He had six dreams, and then he had this, this vision, and then he knew now, because they were going to widen his road, and that was a vision he had been given, and they were going to tear it out and widen the road, and he knew by that that it was time for him to go west. So he comes and starts preaching on December 30th, 1962. He preaches this message, is this the sign of the end, sir? And he says, it's on the backside. When a book is completed, not, not did he say on the front side, he said on the backside, after it's all done completed, then these seven thunders, voices, is the only thing that's stuck to the book that's not revealed. It's not even written in the book. This is Brother Branham's understanding of the seven thunders. Because he sees the seven seals, when you go to Revelation chapter 6, he sees when the first one was open, uh, uh, a white horse went forth and a rider went on it, and he sees the symbology, so he knows that it's open in symbol form. He's, there's, so, so there's seven seals, and there's symbols that go along with it that's in the Bible. But then there's seven thunders over here in Revelation 10, which he calls the back part of the book. And there's not, nothing's written about them at all. They're not even revealed. And he says, it's not even written in the book. This is Brother Branham's understanding. Now we're going to see his understanding is going to change. 
But this is his understanding. And then in the first he says, and then there's coming forth seven mysterious thunders that's not even written at all. We just read it there. And that's right, and I believe that through these seven thunders will be revealed in the last days in order to get the bride together for rapturing faith. Because what we got right now, we wouldn't be able to do it. There's something we've got to step farther. We can't have enough faith for divine healing, hardly. So the prophet of God saying, we need something more than we have now, and what we need is going to bring a, a rapturing faith to the bride, and it's gonna come at the revelation of those seven, seven thunders, amen? which are what? The unwritten portion, the unrevealed. He says, he goes on to say in the, in the same message, and the seven thunders, right in the revelation here of Jesus Christ, it's some mystery. Does not the Bible say that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ? Why there is some hidden mystery then of it. Hmm, what is it? The seven thunders have it. For John was just about to write and a voice came down from heaven and said, don't write it, but seal it, seal it up. Put it on the backside of the book. It's got to be revealed. It's the mysteries. So here he's saying the same thing. It's not even written. It's sealed up. It's on the backside of the book. And this is his understanding before the opening of the seals. But we're going to find that at the opening of the seals, his understanding changes. He's saying it's something that's not written in the Bible at all. He said there's not one word written about it. It's some revelation that has to be given. Amen. And there's nothing written about it. And what he's saying is true. In the seven thunders, it, it, was, it was spoke, but nothing was written. John was told not to write. It's sealed up. That's what he's calling the other set of seals, those seven mysterious seals, those seals on the backside of the book. That's all the way he refers to it. And he says not written in the Bible at all. But now in 1965, we come to the rapture message. And he says, now the book was written, but then remember, it was sealed with seven seals. And these seven seals was not to be opened, Revelation 10, until the sounding of the last earthly angel on earth, Revelation 10, 7, see. And in the days of the sounding of the last angel's message, seventh angel, the mystery of God should be finished in that age. That, and that's the age that we're living in. We all know we're living in the Laodicea age. There will never be another age to it. It can't be. So we're living in the Laodicea age, and these seven seals that's held that book is a mystery to people, should be opened at that day. That's what he promised. Now, it won't be nothing outside the word because you can't add to the word or take from the word. It's got to remain always the word. But the revelation is to reveal the truth of it, what it is, to make it fit with the rest of scriptures. Here the prophet of God just changed his understanding. At first his understanding was it's not written in the Bible at all, but after the seals are open, he says, no, it's got to be written in the Bible. It's got to be laying in there, but it's unrevealed. It's in mystery form. Nobody knew what it was, but in the end time, he's gonna take the seals off of it and reveal it because you can't add one word or take one word away. So it's got to be a mystery that's in the gospel. It's got to already be there, but in the end time, there's coming another mystery that'll give us an understanding of the Bible, just like the mystery that Paul had gave him an understanding of the Old Testament. Now there's going to be a mystery revealed that's going to unlock the New Testament and the entire Bible. Amen. Now he says in the seventh seal, now you remember it was in the pyramid. Do you remember the vision of Junior Jackson's pyramid? In Junior Jackson's pyramid, he saw uh, at the top of a great hill, there was a great rock like a pyramid shape, and it had writing inscribed on the outside like hieroglyphics. And Brother Branham was going around with the brothers, and he was interpreting the writing, amen, on the outside of the rock. And when he got done, he reached in the air and grabbed a sharp tool like a crowbar, ripped the top of it off, and inside was white granite rock. And he said, lights never shone on this before. And he said, it was, it was white rock unwritten word, unwritten word, nothing written, just like the seven thunders. Now listen what he says. Now it was in the pyramid where the mysterious white rock was not written on. And the angels took me in the pyramid of themselves. Now he's attaching that dream to getting caught up in that constellation of seven angels out in Sunset Mountain. He says, and the angels took me into the pyramid of themselves, the mysteries of God known only to them, and now they with the messengers that come to interpret that pyramid or that message of the secret of these seven seals which lays with inside the pyramid. Inside the pyramid, where? 
on the white rock with nothing written on it where light has, there's never been a revelation of this yet because it's the seven thunders. It's the part that John was told not to write. It's sealed up. Where is it sealed? It's in the rock of revelation. It's in the word of God. Amen. And outside was writing. Everybody could read first seal, white horse, second seal, amen, black horse, or red horse, third seal. They could read that. They could go on the outside and read that. They could read uh, about the atonement and redemption and, and salvation and blood of Jesus Christ and the Messiah. They were reading all of that, but they didn't know that inside this pyramid, there's something that's a mystery that's been hidden in the Bible, in the entire Bible, has had a white, unrevealed light never shined on this mystery before. It was sealed. Who unsealed it? Amen. That crowbar came into the hand of the prophet. Amen. To take the top off. Why? Because in Sabino Canon, the sword came into his hand, which is the word of God. And he took the word of God and opened up the mystery of the Bible so that we could see the great mystery that's been laying through the entire Bible. What is it? It's the mystery of the gospel. It's the mystery of the Bible. It's the great mystery that was in the back part of God's mind that he held the entire time. And it revealed to us the plan that God had from before the foundation of the world. Amen. He says, then we go back to sirs, is this, is this the sign of the end, sir? So you notice, even Brother Brenham's title, is this the sign of the end, sir? Why is he asking, is this the sign of the end? Because this mystery has to be sealed until the end. So he's asking, is this the sign of the end? That seventh seal, amen, Brother Branham called it the end time seal. So that seventh seal, which is Revelation 10, 1 to 7, can't be open till the end time. Amen. Now he has these uh, dreams that are given to him that he has the interpretation of. He's got the, the warning by vision to go out west. He gets caught up in a constellation of angels by vision in his room. All of this is marking, go back west for the revelation of the seven seals. And he's asking, is this it? Is this the sign of the end, sir? And he answers his own question in this message. Yes, it is the sign of the end because these things are sealed up until the time of the end, just like he told Daniel. And at the unsealing of them marks the end time. It's over for the Gentiles. Now back again, and is this a sign of the end, sir? You notice the writing was on the rock. I was interpreting it for them. They were elated. That's the mystery of God that's been not understood for years. Could that be that? And then notice, in some mysterious way, we picked up out of the air a sharp tool that opened up the top, and then there was white granite, but it wasn't interpreted. There was no letters. I didn't interpret that, Junior. I just looked at it and said to the brethren, look on this. Listen, so he's interpreting the dream right here in the pulpit. The the pyramid, the opening the top, the white rock, And he says, I told the brothers, look on this. Stay here and look on this. And he went out west. Because he's preaching now, serves as a sign. He's letting us know that there's a mystery to be revealed in the seven thunders in the Bible. And he's saying, look on this. And he's telling the whole church, I'm going out west. God's led me out west. I'm going out west. You all remain here. And listen what he says. He says, I didn't interpret that, Junior. I just looked at it and said to the brethren, look on this, and that's fulfilled tonight. That dream was fulfilled, and sirs, is this the sign of the end? Or is this the sign of the end, sirs? He told them, you look on this. There's there's, there's, There's something the lights never shine on. You look on this. I'm going out west. He says, and listen to what he says, and while they were studying that, I slipped towards the west. What for? Maybe to understand the interpretation of what's written in the top of this. Could it be? (laughs) I told you he answers his own question in here. Absolutely, this is what he's going out west for. And those blasting the other morning that shook me plumb till I raised up in the air. Now he's talking about getting caught up in the constellation in Sabino Canyon. Till I raised up in the air as high as this building, that constellation of angels, seven angels in the form of a pyramid, Is that them thunders that's coming forth? Could it be? I'm sorry, yeah, he's talking, this is not talking about Sabino Canyon, it's talking about in his room, the vision he just had a week earlier. 
Is that them thunders that's coming forth? Could it be? Whenever he says, could it be, just say yes. Because now we know the rest of the story. Could it be? Yes. Could it be that I'm going out to get the interpretation? Yes. Could it be that these seven thunders? Yes. Is this the sign of the end, sir? Yes, it is the sign of the end. We are in the end time. Amen. We're at the end of the Gentile dispensation. Church ages has ended. We are here. Amen. He said, this is all interpreted according to his dream. It was all finished according to God's word. The seventh messenger will finish. Seventh message will be finished. And then the seven thunders. Praise God. Let's go to Colossians chapter four. I don't care how many times I review this. It thrills my soul. Why? Because what Brother Branham's doing is he's coming in here to the Bible, amen, and God, amen, brought him up into that pyramid, the constellation of angels, amen, to the revelation known only to them, to what? To the place the lights never shined before, to the granite white rock. What is, what is a right rock? It's a word, it's a revelation of the word, amen, but nothing's written on it. It's a mystery, it's a secret, and it's inside the word. And Brother Branham's not saying it's outside the word anymore. Now he knows it's in the word. It's just been missed for all these generations. The church ages missed it. Amen. But it's not going to be missed anymore because God bought a prophet just like the apostle Paul who's preaching to us the mystery of the gospel. And go back and pull it all out. Colossians chapter four, verse three. He says, with all praying also for us that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Paul was preaching the mystery of Christ. Let's go to Colossians chapter one. This one's super familiar to us. This comes out of Brother Benham's opening context in Colossians one. He reads from 15 all the way down to 29 when he preaches Christ is the mystery God revealed. But I'd like to pick it up just at verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. This was the mystery that Paul was beginning to preach. And this mystery remained a mystery through the church ages. But in the end time, at the opening of the seven seals, he came back to show us what was inside the book. Amen, there's so many things that I, I wanna share on that. Brother Branham said that this Bible is the book of life. Right? He called it the book of life. He called it a book of redemption. He called the book in the hand of him that sitteth on the throne in Revelation 4, he called that the book of life, right? He called that our marriage certificate. They asked him what, you asked him what was in that book in his hand, and it was names. What kind of names? Names of the elect. Amen, Amen. And, and he said, now he's calling names, but he's not calling names like reading off a list. He's not calling names like John Doe, and, and the, he's not doing that, but he's revealing the mysteries as he's calling those names. Because if your name is in that book, then you're in this book. And then he tells us, and what is the believers? They're the words in the book. And so what is the book? It's the record of Christ. It's the marriage certificate. It's the book of life. It's the book of redemption. It's all the same thing. So that book that was in the hand of him that sitteth on the throne, that book was sealed and had to be opened. Amen, and that opened the book of life. It opened uh, the book of redemption. It opened the marriage certificate. It opened the, the record of the family of God. It opened all of those things. It opened that, and when it opened that, it also opened this. And then when it opened this, then you could see yourself in the word now. Now you could see I'm part of this. 
We're not looking down to try to find our name like Chad Lamb. I'm trying to find my identification, who I really am in the word. And I couldn't do it, amen, just in the church age doctrine anymore because we come to the time for the revealing of the mysteries. And now he come and he pulled apart. Now he, he's trying to do away with all the guesswork and reading this and saying, I think I am, maybe I'm saved. I put my faith in Christ, but then I made a mistake the other day. And now there's Calvinism. Now there's Arminianism. And am I always saved or did I make a mistake? And, and now there's always an identity crisis down through the church ages. But he come at the end of time to peel the seals away so that he could come back and show us the mystery that is in this Bible. And the mystery is not you hopefully will be saved. The mystery is not if you're a good boy, you'll be saved. But the mystery is you were part of God from before the foundation of the world. That's the white rock that's on the inside. It's the mystery of God himself as he decided to portion himself out over time to reveal his great mystery of himself and pulled it back together at the end time so that he could pull everything together in Christ, that which is in heaven and in earth, all in him. Amen. This isn't about being deep. This isn't about being revelated. This is about your identification. It's about looking in the mirror of God's word and saying, Mama, that's me. That's me. I was part of God. I come from God. I'm going back to God. I'm not afraid of not making the rapture. I'm not afraid of falling apart. I'm not afraid. Why? Because he's revealed to me my part in the book. When the book was sealed, I was sealed in the book. When the book was unsealed, my identity was unsealed. To take away fear and scare and all these tactics of the devil. Amen. Is it simple? Is it plain to you? Oh my goodness. We can go into all kinds of details that'll make your head spin and my head spin. Amen. There's so many details. Why? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. How are you going to put it? Uh, how are you going to boil it down to three words? He's all and in all. You could talk about it forever. He's going to be unfolding himself throughout eternity. We can talk about it from every angle you want to talk about it. We can use all kinds of language and words. We can never come to the end of it. But when you boil it all down, it keeps coming back to the same revelation that you are part of God. You were with him before the foundation of the world. You were in his mind. That mystery that he had in the back part of his mind included you as an individual. And he'd come to the end time to take the seals off so that you could see who you really are. Amen. Praise God. Is it simple? Yes. Is it complex? Yes. Is it easy to understand? Yes. Is it deep beyond understanding? Yes. Praise God. I love it. I love it on the surface. I love it in the depths. I love it in the mysteries. I love the part I understand. I love the part I don't understand. I love realizing I thought I understood and still didn't understand when somebody else could. I like that too. I want God to be unsearchable. I want it to be the unsearchable riches of Christ. I don't want to come to the end of Revelation. I don't want to bump into it and say, well, that's it. That's all we're going to get. God's not going to reveal himself anymore. I want a God whose resources never run out. I want a God who's beyond my understanding. I want a God that I can't boil down and put in my bottle and control in any way. I want a God that's bigger than anything I've ever comprehended, far beyond my understanding. I want a God that wants to be searched and found and wants to unveil himself to his children. I want a God who's new every day. I want a God who's constantly revealing himself to me. I want him deep. I want him wide. I want him shallow. I want him on the surface. I want him in the depths. I want him in the cracks. I want him in the crevices. I want him in plain sight. I want him everywhere. That's what this revelation is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what is Jesus Christ? The Word. What is the Word? The very thought of God being expressed. He is the anointed Word for our day, which is fullness, not partiality. We could preach this for 300 years and we're never gonna come to the end of the message. Because it unlocked the mystery of God. It finished the mystery of God and unlocked the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Brother Branham comes along and he starts preaching things that blow the mind of the ecclesiastical world. What Brother Branham did was the same thing Paul did. Amen. He 
says, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Now God had a purpose and a hidden mystery. And that's what I want to speak on to the church this morning. The hidden mystery of God that he had in his mind before the world ever began. And how that it's unfolded itself right down to this present hour that we're living. See, when you will understand clearly then, you see on, I believe, what is being done. God's great mystery of how it's a secret. He kept it a secret. Nobody knew nothing about it. Even the angels didn't understand it. He didn't reveal it. That's the reason under our seventh mystery, when the seventh seal was opened, there was silence. Jesus, when he was on earth, they wanted to know when he would come. He said, it's not even the son of man himself don't know when it's going to happen. See, God has this all to himself. It's a secret. What's a secret? A mystery. And that's the reason there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. What's that? That's Revelation 8, 1, the opening of the seventh seal, which Brother Branham connected to Revelation 10, 1 to 7 and made them the same event. Okay. Therefore, the entire Bible, oh my. Let me pick up this sentence again and then I'll get to this. And that's the reason there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour and even, and listen, and seven thunders uttered their voices. There was silence in heaven and seven thunders uttered their voices. Now listen to what he says next. And John was forbidden to write it. See the coming of the Lord. It's a mystery. It's a secret that he wants to make plain to his children. See, when Brother Branham comes to Christ's mystery of God revealed, he preaches this in July 28th in 1963, but he preaches the seals in March of 1963. And when he comes to the seventh seal, when Brother Branham comes to the seventh seal, he spends a lot of time reviewing the previous seals. He goes in to the sixth seal quite a bit and reviews it and talks about Revelation chapter seven. And, he, and, he, and he's doing like a lot of review and he's looking back. And, and if, if you're like me, you know, I've given you my testimony on that before, you're like me, you're anticipating the seventh seal now, right? Because we got the first six. We know what a white horse rider is now. I got that. that I know that that's Antichrist spirit. And then I know what beast went out to anoint it. And I know souls under the altar and now tribulation. We know all that. And then he comes to the seventh seal and he's really reviewing the sixth seal and he's going into Revelation chapter seven, these two groups of people and the interim. And, and now he's coming up to the seventh seal and he gets ready to start explaining the seventh seal. And he says a sentence or two. And he says, I feel to stop right there. I feel to stop right there. Why? It's a mystery. He was told that he can't explain it. He explained the first two, and he got in trouble with the angel. But he was told not to explain this third one. So, so he can't tell you what it is. He can't explain it to you. So when he says, I feel to stop, go no further, right here in my notes, I wrote stop, go no further. Then he starts to say, but remember the vision I told you many years ago? Remember the baby? You remember the tent? And he said, this will be your third pull. And the other day in Sabino Canyon, and that sword struck my hand, and that voice said, this is your third pull? What's he doing? At first, the first time I listened to this, I'm like, what is he talking about? Just tell me what the seventh seal is. Would you just tell me, just like you said, white horse is this and it means that. Why didn't you do this with the seventh seal? And so we're going through this. And what he's doing is he's told by the angel, don't explain it. So what's he doing? He's coming just like Jesus and he's showing by parables. Remember the vision I told you. I feel to stop, say no more. You remember the vision that I told you? What's he doing? He's telling you what the seventh seal is without telling you what the seventh seal is. Amen. Why? Because this is not for carnal impersonations. This is not for anybody to pick up. This is only for the elect. Amen. And he goes through and he starts talking in parables and he starts tying parables and dreams and visions together. And he explains a few things. Amen. And then he stops. And then he comes a few months later and he comes and preaches Christ is the mystery of God revealed. And in Christ, the mystery of God revealed, to my opinion, based on what he's saying, he starts to bring the revelation of the seventh seal. 
Because he says it's silence for half an hour and seven thunders uttered their voice and John was forbidden to write it. See, no one knows what it is. See the coming of the Lord. Now he's starting to tie it all together and show us what the opening of the seventh seal really is. Amen. He says, and that's one thing he hasn't revealed yet of how he will come and when he will come. It's a good thing he doesn't know. Oh, there's so many things I want to say. <laughs> Brother Ben, standing here, getting ready to preach Christ is the mystery of God revealed. And what is the opening of the seventh seal? The mystery of God shall be revealed. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he begins to sound, the mystery of God shall be revealed. The opening of the seventh seal. And here he comes with a title that says, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. It's Christ. It's the coming of Christ. It's the coming of the Lord. And it is the mystery of God revealed. And then he tells us that it's the coming of the Lord. And he says, that's one thing he hasn't revealed yet. My, I love God. You read that and say, that's one thing he hasn't revealed yet of how he will come and when he will come. It's a good thing he doesn't. Nope. And you say, well, seven seals not revealed. He just said he hasn't revealed it yet. Amen. Then you go to the next paragraph. He has showed it or revealed it in every type that's in the Bible. Therefore, the entire Bible is the revelation of God's mystery in Christ, which is the seventh seal because Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Amen. So now he says he has showed it or revealed in every type that's in the Bible. Therefore, the entire Bible is the revelation of God's mystery in Christ. Hmm, the entire Bible is an expression of one goal that God had, one purpose he wanted to achieve in the entire Bible. And all the acts of the believers in the Bible has been in type and expressing what God's great goal is. And now in the last day, he has revealed it and shows it. And God said, well, you'll see it right here this morning. Yes. Wait a second. He hasn't revealed it yet. It's a good thing he doesn't know. But... You'll see it right here this morning. It's not revealed. How will I see it? Because he's not going to explain it. He's just going to preach it. And God's going to bring the revelation. Amen. Amen. Oh, and with God's help, well, I, I love that. And with God's help, you'll see it right here this morning. What the Lord has had in his mind all along and has expressed it. He says, Christ is the mystery of God revealed for the text I want to take here, this for a text, basing it upon the entire Bible. But I want us to title this, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Christ being the mystery of God revealed. Don't think of that title and put it far away. Because Christ is the anointed word. Amen. And remember, Abraham's seed was Christ. And by faith, you're what? Abraham's seed. Amen. So that makes you part of Christ. Because if he was the word, she has to be the word also. And he is the fullness of the word, and she has part in that. Amen. So Christ, the, the, the manifested or anointed word, is the mystery of God revealed, and you and I have a part in that revelation. Amen. When he comes to souls that are in prison now, I just want to read a couple more. He says, but one day <coughs> he rose from there and came forth where there was a book at. Where was the book at? It was still in the abstract owner, God Almighty. And John looked around and wept because there was no, one, no man even worthy to look on the book and especially open the seals to reveal what the hidden mystery was. The mysteries was in the seven seals. When those seven seals was opened, that opened up the entire Bible. The seven seals, it was sealed with seven mysteries. And in those seven seals held the entire mystery of it. And it was the book of redemption, New Testament. Praise God. This is the, the, the next quote I want to read. This day, the scripture is fulfilled. This is from February of 1965. And he said, the seven seals of the hidden mysteries of the entire Bible will be opened and fulfill Revelation 10 that in the seven 
seventh angel's message, these things should come to pass. This day, this scripture is fulfilled before your eyes. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. Praise be to God. This was 1965, and he's telling us, amen, the seven seals of the hidden mysteries of the entire Bible will be opened and fulfilled, Revelation 10, in the, in, that in the seventh angel's message, these things should come to pass. This day, this script, he's letting you know, Revelation 10, 1 to 7 is fulfilled. What does it mean? Is this the sign of the end, sir? Yes. Is this the end time? Yes. Is Gentile dispensations over? Yes. Amen. Is it the marking of the end of everything? What is the seventh seal? It's the end time seal. When it goes forth, it marks the end of everything, but it goes out in cycles. One thing goes out and bursts, end of denominations, and then another thing ends, then another thing ends, all the way till even time itself ends. This is the end time seal, the wrapping up, conclusion, finishing of everything that God's been wanting to do. And it's been written in the white rock on the inside of the pyramid that you can't add one word or take one word away. You can't have, you can't come up with something that's not in the Bible. What you have to do is you have to get the revelation and the revelation must dovetail with the word of God. Why? Because it was laying in there in mystery form. This is why Brother Bram says you've got to read between the lines. Why? Because there's a mystery laying the white rock, the unwritten portion. Amen. Where is it? It's veiled. It's veiled behind the, the types and the shadows and the characters of the Bible. They They've all been revealing it, but in time. But now in the end time, he's taken the veil away so that we can go back and we can read the book of Esther and say, Mama, that's me. We can read Ruth and say, Mama, that's me. We can read through all these, these books of the Bible and say, my, I can't believe I've missed this all my life. I can't believe we've been missing all of these great truths. Why? He pulled back the seals to reveal the mystery that was contained in the Bible. And that mystery... Brother Bram comes and Christ is the mystery of God revealed and says it was revealed in a threefold manner. One purpose, one goal, one thing God wanted to accomplish. This was the mystery veiled in the back part of his mind that nobody through the Bible knew. They took parts of it in pieces and had bits of revelation, but nobody could compile the whole revelation and put it together. Why? It was sealed under those seven thunders. But in the end time, God would have, amen, the seventh angel here on earth in the Laodicean church age, and he would get caught up into a constellation of angels, come back for the revelation of the seven seals, amen, so that he could take the veil off of the word so he could come then later and preach Christ as the mystery of God revealed. So that we would see it's me. Colossians 1, 25, 27, that's me. The great mystery that he had in his mind is that he was going to reveal himself through people. That he was going to come and reveal himself in what? The Lamb's book of life. What is it? People. Yes. This Bible is the record of human beings from the beginning to the end. Every story is about people. All the characters are people. All the prophets are people. It's people from beginning to end. It's the book of life. It's the family of God. It's the record of Christ. And guess what? I found my identity in this book. Not more confusion, not am I, could I be, I might be, I hope I am, but at the opening of the seven seals, all the mystery and scare has been taken away. I am part of this revelation. Brother Bam, he comes and he, he takes things that we took for granted And he comes and he, he takes the gospel and he preaches the mystery of the gospel. He comes and he shows us so many things that I, I, I don't have time to get into them all, neither do I, I, I even prepare to get into many of them. But he starts teaching things that we took for granted. And like what salvation is and what the blood is for and what redemption is and, and what does it mean to be redeemed. And, and, and you know, we had an idea through the, 
through the denominational world that being redeemed means that I was, I was in a junk pile, amen, and he come to a junk pile and he come and pulled me out and he, and he paid for me and he redeemed me. But Brother Branham comes at the, at, the, at the revelation of God's mystery and he comes and he takes us deeper because he preaches the mystery behind the gospel and he says, you can't redeem what wasn't yours to begin with. The reason that we're redeemed is because we were with God before the foundation of the world as an attribute of God and now we're redeemable because we were with him before. It's not God feeling sorry for certain individuals and you're a poor one and, and if you'll just be nice and obey me and believe in me, I will, I will redeem you. That's not what redemption is. Redemption is the little lost lamb that was with the shepherd before has separated from the flock and in the darkness of the world and the shepherd's coming down to find the lamb to what? Restore the lamb back to the shepherd to redeem it back and now Calvary was not about God feeling sorry for a bunch of people and hoping that somebody would accept his pardoning grace. Amen. There's going to be a group, amen, that will get a pardon because of what they did with the word they had. But that's not, Calvary came for redemption. Calvary came for the elect seed. He came down and paid the price for the earth because he had himself sown into the earth in a lost condition. So he came himself to pay the price of blood for redemption. Brother Branham took redemption and took it to the depths of God and took it back to the mind of God. Amen. Now there's no more, uh, you know, there's no more, you know, Brother Bram even talked about, don't even like those prayers where you say, don't you want to see grandma someday and don't you want to do this and, and won't you accept poor Jesus died for you, won't you accept what he did for you? My, Jesus died, amen, for redemption, to redeem back, amen, the portion of God that God had portioned. Redem Brother Bram says, only the elect is considered in redemption. Only the elect is considered in redemption. And all of a sudden, all the Armenian believers, their minds just go pow, amen, because they cannot understand. Why? Because he knows the mystery of God. He's been behind the veil, amen. The mystery's taken off the book, and he now understands there's been one goal one God wanted to achieve, and he's done it in a threefold manner, and that is to get preeminence in a man. He did that in Jesus, to get preeminence in a people. He's doing that now in you and I to restore him back to Eden so God can manifest himself. Brother Bram takes all these doctrines, takes these doctrines and he begins to preach the mystery of the gospel and people can't take it. They can't take it because Brother Bram said even some ministers will misunderstand because they've been taught to believe scripture in a certain way. Right. Amen. Same thing, reason that they didn't believe the apostle Paul is the same reason they didn't believe Brother Branham. Yeah, right. Because it wasn't intellectually obvious. They had been studying the Bible and reading the verses and reading the scriptures and they had an understanding, but Brother Brenham comes because his understanding by the opening of the seals is so much greater than the understanding they had previously. Amen, now the mystery is peeled back. Now we know why Christ came, why we know how to, what about why it had to be a virgin birth? Why it had to be a blood atonement? It all goes back to the serpent seed and the fall in the garden. Amen, all of these things, what is it? It's the mystery of the gospel. Amen. And that's what's been handed to us, the mystery of the gospel. There's so many things. I would love to take those things one by one, the doctrines, and get to, to take what we commonly understood and then what Brother Branham does with it. It's absolutely mesmerizing Amen. what he does with justification, blood atonement, salvation, predestination, adoption. All of these things, they go so deep, friends, it reveals the very mind of God. Amen. But I want to finish with just a, a few quotes out of the message paradox. Brother Branham says, he said, so there was Joshua representing grace, was right along with law, but could not be enforced as long as law was in the proper place. And so has the church world in this last day is coming along. It's played its part, but there's coming a time where it must cease, it must do it. There's got to be an Ephesians also of this journey. Just as there was of other journeys, there's, 
There has to come an Ephesians, an Ephesus, an Ephesians of this journey. And Brother Bram said that it was really uh, uh, amazing to me. I've been looking at this and meditating on it for a while. Amen. Brother Bram preached a message called Joshua, uh, Joshua types Ephesians. And Joshua is a book of placing. It's a book of coming out an uh, exodus and coming to a promised land and being placed in that land. And Joshua was the agent that God would use and he would bring him across Jordan in a miraculous way after a, 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 a journey, amen, through the wilderness journey where they saw failure and they saw a mistake and they saw all kinds of things, amen, now they're coming across Jordan into a place of separation and now they're coming into the promised land and the entering here is pure grace, pure grace. They didn't earn it, they didn't work for it, they didn't pay for it, this is God's land and God said, I'm giving you this land. It's absolute election and absolute grace. It's predestination, election, and grace. They had nothing to do with it. Abraham didn't pay money for it. God says, I'm giving you this land. Amen. Then they got into all kinds of chaos, and, and they had all kinds of issues happen, and they find themselves in slavery down in Egypt, and they're in Egypt for 400 years, and afterwards, God raises up uh, a Moses to come and bring them out. This is all election. This is all grace. This is all mercy. And they come across by pure grace and election. He says, I'm giving you this land. It's yours. Go and possess it. You get to go here. This tribe goes here. This tribe here. This family here. What's Joshua doing? He's placing the church. You're here and you're here. You're here. You're here. It, it, it's a placing. It's an adoption. They're coming into the land. And, and it's all by grace. Moses was law, but Joshua, Brother Bram said, was grace. He represented the grace of God. Why? Because it's placing. Now, he says Joshua uh, types or parallels Ephesians. So now he says there's got to be an Ephesians at the end of the journey. There's got to be an Ephesians. There's another quote here in Paradox where he says, but we're promised according to Revelation 10 and according to Malachi 4 and St. Luke 22, 17 and so forth, there has got to come an Ephesians to this. There is promised it, friends. So what does he call the Ephesians? Revelation 10, Malachi 4, Luke 22, 17. What is it? It's the coming of the message. It's the coming of the, uh, of the secret revealed, the mysteries of the seven thunders, the seven seals being opened, the great mystery of God now has to come, what? To be our Ephesians. What is our Ephesians? I chose you, you didn't choose me. Remember how Ephesians chapter one starts? We've been reading it when we've been talking about the mystery of his will. Amen. According to the good pleasure of his will, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amen. When he chose us before the foundation of the world, what did we have to do with it? Nothing. He did the choosing according to the good pleasure of his will. This is our Ephesians coming at the end time. At the opening of the seals, we realize I didn't do anything. The only thing I could have done was ruin this. It's what he did before the foundation of the world when he chose me in Christ. Christ and chose me unto adoption. He chose me for an Ephesians age. Amen. What was Ephesians? Ephesians was the first church age. This is where the apostle Paul, amen, was bringing them out of Judaism and he was bringing the Gentiles out of heathenism and he was bringing them into the New Testament church. And Ephesians starts off with what? Grace, pure, absolute grace. You are this by his choice. You're chosen in adoption by his choice. You were chosen in Christ Jesus by his good pleasure. You've been accepted in the beloved because he wanted to. That was Ephesians, amen? But they fell from their Ephesians just like Israel fell from their crossing, from their taking the land. But he said there's got to come an Ephesians in the end time. And it's gonna take the opening of the word to bring us back to Ephesians. Here's... I would like to read that again because I didn't finish the quote. I got a little too excited. It said, we're promised according to Revelation 10, according to Malachi 4 and St. Luke 22, 17 and so forth, that there has got to come an Ephesians to this. This is promised it, friends. There must come an Ephesians that these sevenfold mysteries of the word of God must be unfolded. What brings Ephesians? The unfolding of the mystery of the Bible. That brings us into our Ephesians. And it's in the Laodicean age that this takes place. 
Further down in paradox, he says, now you cannot add nothing to the book or take anything from it. Revelation 22, 18 says, who will, who will ever will add one word or take one word, his part will be taken from the book of life. Now we cannot add or take. So therefore we know that Luther could not get to it, Wesley and so forth, the reformers, Knox, Finney, Calvin, on down so forth, they didn't get it all, but what they had was the gospel truth. Do you believe that? They couldn't get it all, but what they had was the gospel truth. But what we have is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. They had the gospel truth all down through the ages, but what we have is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. And now, in the last days, we are given the understanding by the word that we are going to understand it because it'll come in Ephesians age to it, and we're here. What is the Ephesians age? Paul, the apostle Paul, placing the church. Amen. What was Joshua? Joshua placing the church. What is the opening of the seventh seal supposed to do? Bring us to adoption, place the church. Where is it placing us? It's placing us in the word. Amen. This is you and this is your territory and this is who you are. Right. And this is what you fulfill and this is the portion of scripture. He's placing us Amen. in the word. An exodus out of denominations and church systems, an exodus out of these things and being put back into the word. Amen. That is our Ephesians. Yes. Now in Joshua, this is, this is why this is so critical. In Joshua, Joshua comes and by, like I said, pure grace and election, he places them in the land. And then after he places them in the land, now he says, now it's your job to possess this land. Amen. It's your job to cultivate it, farm it, raise crops, worship God, keep it clean, keep it pure, raise your children, worship God, come to the temple three times a year. I mean, now it's, it's pure grace. It's pure grace and election that brings you into the land. But now it's your responsibility to possess the land and live in it according to God and shine the light and be the word of God made flesh in the land. And now, according to Malachi 4 and Revelation 10, 7, there's to be an Ephesians age again where we're taken out in a third exodus and brought back to a placing of the church. And where is he placing the bride? He's placing us in Christ, the revealed word. And then what does he say? Now live it. Now manifest it, now possess the word, now possess it and stay with it and manifest it and keep the, keep, keep the wild beast away and cultivate it and grow it and amen, stay in the land and shine the light and be the nation set on a hill, be the word of God made flesh. Amen, there's coming Ephesians once again, friends. And what did he do first? He opened the seals. Why was that so important? Because if we're still wondering what the plan of God is and who we are and if I'm included and, and what's going to happen and, and who's in and who's out and which one's right, we never go and possess the land. So first he had to come and clean up all the misunderstanding so that we could properly know who we are and what God wants to do. Then he could place us in the word and then leave us by the spirit of God to possess the land. Oh, God, help us to possess this land. Help us to have eyes open. Hey, listen, it's not laws. It's not do's and don'ts. It's not a have to. Amen. When God said, this is your land, they were so excited to march into that land. They were so excited to set up a home. They were so excited to be cultivating and growing and exploring. Amen. And when this word was restored, he said, live the word. Amen. <clears throat> it wasn't like he was saying, if you don't, I'll cut you off. He already took care of that for us. He's not, going to, he's not going to lose one. But this is the age. We're not going to fall like first Ephesians fell. She's predestinated not to. The veil's been taken so she can step back in to her position and finish what the first church didn't finish. To live this word, to manifest it, to display Jesus Christ in a many-membered body. 
That's what we're here for. And that's what the seals unveiled to you and I. Our position, our portion, and our placing and our responsibility. Praise God. Let's all stand. Amen. Musicians, if you'll come. Brother Ben, if you'll come. Friends, there's a gospel. Give your heart to the Lord. Surrender to his word. Come to church. Live the word. That, there's a gospel. But the power comes in the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Who we are and why. Why redemption by blood. Why election? Why predestination? Why a prophet? Why the opening of the word? Why? The real power to live comes in the unveiling of the seven seals. Taking away the mystery of who the bride really is and bringing us into the picture. I say, oh, thank God. All of those children of Israel who crossed that Jordan and took their land, they knew it wasn't for another age. They knew it was for them. They crossed on dry land. They got the portion. They felt the dirt. Amen. They knew it wasn't for another age. This isn't, they knew it was for them. Say, oh God, help me cross this Jordan of denominationalism and Gentile dispensation and move into separation by your grace. Amen. And come in here to know that this is for me. This is my position. This is my place. Amen. I'm so thankful for the mystery of the gospel that was boldly proclaimed in this end time. And I thank God he had a mouthpiece here to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for me. Amen, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful, Lord, for your word. God, I'm so thankful to be standing at the end of time. God, there was men, your children, your elect seed that come up in every generation and every dispensation. And God, each, each one was so thrilled with the revelation of the word for their hour. They were thrilled with the teaching of true justific justification. They were thrilled with sanctification. They were thrilled with the restoration of the gifts and it was their portion, their meat, their life. But oh God, how blessed are we to be standing at the very end of time when the veil has been taken off the entire word. God, when you revealed, Lord, yourself and your eternal purpose, your plan that you had from before the foundation of the world, oh God, thank you for allowing us to come now. Thank you for sending a prophet in our age. Thank you for the bold proclamation of this message, Lord. For God, you've given us ears to hear and a heart to perceive by your grace. And Lord, we recognize it's pure, unadulterated grace. It's pure predestination and election. And we're so thankful. You've given us the land. You've taken us over. Now, God, help us to possess this land, to live in it, to grow, to manifest you. I love you, Lord. I thank you for this privilege. God, all that we say and do, I pray, God, that you would just magnify it into the hearts of your children. All that we're trying, Lord, to do, God, human efforts fail constantly. We can't speak right. We can't explain ourselves right. We can't articulate what's so deep in our hearts. But God, I pray that you'd come and you'd bring revelation in the way that only you can, that you would quicken it to each heart, to each one of your children. And may they be able to look in the word after it's been unveiled and say, Mama, that's me. That belongs to me, that's who I am. God, may you give us each one courage to keep pressing forward, to possess this great land you put us in, to magnify your word and manifest it in our lives. May we manifest it in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces. May we become, Lord, that second fold of your threefold plan to have preeminence in a people. May we become the very manifestation of that promise. Lord, we love you. 
pray that you bless your people as we go from here. Make this reality sweeter to us every day of our lives. Make it more real, Lord, to us and help us to live it, Lord. We love you and we thank you. Be with each one. Bless us, Lord, as we go and come back this evening for feet washing and communion. Just pray, God, you'd be with us in all we do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And God bless you. We'll let you go with the song, and then we'll be back today, Lord willing, at 4 p.m. for communion and feet washing. Amen. God bless you. Amen. I want more of Jesus. Oh, more and more and more. I want more of Jesus than I've ever had before. I want more of His great love, so rich, so full.
came face to face with eternal life. Lord, I thank Thee. Oh, not even in my wildest dreams, oh, did I think I'd see such things as the coming. Spoken word is the original sea, and Lord, I thank Thee. Oh, and I just want to thank You, Lord, oh, for letting me hear Your word. What have I done to deserve such glory?
time is near Where everything that I hold dear Will lay before the holy And soon we find All my works and all my deeds And every prayer said on Not our 
hearts burn within us as he talked to us by the way. He opened to us the scriptures, the word revealed to us today. We can see the word in person. He's among us alive today. And he opened our understanding in simplicity Christ revealed. Now I know that He desires to have fellowship with me. He revealed something more within that until now I did not see. I pray, dear Lord, please take my life Live in me and I in thee. Oh, and grant that every day you'll commune with me. Oh, now I know that He desires to have fellowship with me. He revealed something more within that until now 